So hi, I was uh, the, the basic narrative that, that I worked this information around was originally written way back in 2002 when I was in Peru on my Fulbright year. And it goes like this. Oh, first I show you the map. The map of where we all, each of us will be speaking about. Uh, my area is Cusco, Hedi is Ayacucho, and Gloria is the Altiplano between Peru and Bolivia. Um, I think you'll be seeing that map again. I, I like to put this one in also because it just reminds us, you know, these mountains, these are very young mountains. In fact, technically they're still growing. So it's pretty impressive um, that, that business about the, the landscape of Peru. Heading out from <clears throat> Cusco, we drive through the mountain landscape, past villages of adobe houses and fields of wheat, alfalfa, and barley grown for local breweries, as well as crops for the community's own use. It is early July, this is 2002, uh, midwinter in the Andes, meaning clear skies and beautiful, crisp, sunny days with chilly nights illuminated by millions of stars. The internationally known Quechua weaver, Nilda Cayenaupa Alvarez's husband, Paulino, is driving a group organized by Nilda from Cusco City today. Um, we're heading for a town called Mawai Pampa, a, a community, one of the CTT Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco villages or communities. Passing through their hometown of Chinchero, which um, actually that one was, this, these are from some other locations in Cusco, but here's Chinchero with the ancient uh, Inca ruins there. Chinchero, where Nilda and Paulino are from, a town of about 10,000 at over 12,000 feet above sea level, we continue finally arriving at the crest of a hill overlooking the valley that cradles Maui Pampa. Just a view of Machu Picchu, just, just FYI. Here's Maui Pampa. As we approach the um, community's weaving shelter, we see that about 25 weavers are awaiting Nilda's arrival. Seated on blankets, they share lunch amongst themselves, large kernels of boiled mote hominy corn, quiet sounds of conversation, discuss freeze drying potatoes to make them last through the year. Later, some spin with drop spindles they twist while walking along and others sit, sit on the ground weaving. This actually isn't Maui Pampa, but it shows you the weaving sitting on the ground um, or on blankets, excuse me, not flat on the ground and on backstrap looms. They lean back to increase tension as needed on their warps while their fingers pick out traditional patterns to interlace into the threads. This is basically a dyeing workshop day um, and uh, they have built fires to heat water for dye baths, and now Nilda instructs them to prepare the vats for dyeing. I hear familiar Quechua words for green, brown, white, and red. I do not know Quechua, but I know quite a few words in Quechua. This day was nearly 20 years ago, and the weavers were using union dyes from the United States. But since then, they've gone back and researched the traditional plant dyes that had those recipes had been lost and they've gotten them back again through research, which is how their beautiful weavings are colored nowadays. This is just one of many improvements Nilda has, has led them in developing to create the handsome textiles that hark back to their ancient ancestors. Nilda calls the roll, collecting from each woman skeins of wool yarn they have spun and washed in preparation for dyeing and entering them into a bucket. She comments on the quality of each spinner's work and how well the wool has been cleaned or not. The dye will not enter oily wool. Only one skein is too dirty, but all the others are pronounced ready for dyeing. At each step, Nilded coaches them on meeting the standards of excellence that she learned as a girl from her mother and other weavers in Chinchero. She has devoted her life to the study of Peruvian textiles and shares her collection and all her knowledge with her communities and interested visitors. This is a culture in which threads, needles, and looms have told the stories for millennia. The late anthropologist Ed Frankmont wrote, no other, quote, no other people in history put so much cultural energy into fiber arts as the Andeans, end of quote. 
These were people in touch with the nature of textile fibers and what their hands and imaginations could craft out of them. Textiles were made in techniques so elaborate, so difficult to achieve, so time consuming and labor intensive as to take one's breath away. They, they know and knew and know how to cultivate and care for all these fibers, the animals that produce them and the plants, how to use a lot, utilize certain plants, insects and minerals as dye stuffs to color them. They've gotten that knowledge back uh, to pr produce exquisite or utilitarian textiles for any type of need from everyday carrying bags to offerings for the gods and divine rulers in ancient times. Now in this contemporary age, after centuries of oppression at the hands of European conquerors, more and more indigenous groups in the Andes have retaken control of their own destiny. Visitors to Cusco can visit a young, a young museum and shop, the Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco, also founded and directed by Nilda. A skilled weaver since childhood and the first Chincherino to get a university education, she has devoted her life to preserving Peru's textile heritage. She got that vocation, I asked her once. Uh, she, she knew she was gonna do that by the time she was 13. I met Nilda during my first year of living in Peru in 1997 when her organization was one year old, the Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco. Now she works with, with uh, 10, at least several hundred, uh, yeah, with several hundred weavers in 10 communities, tiny villages often many hours by foot from the nearest small rural town. The communities, each with their special trademarks and skills, are located throughout the Cusco region. Kathy? Yes? Can I ask a question? Someone yeah. wants to know what the whorls are made of. Are they bone, horn, clay? The one on the left is wood and clay, and the other one, which actually is rather ancient, um, is wood and clay. Thank you. The communities, each with their special trademarks and skills, are all over the Cusco region. She shows the weavers fine antique examples, encouraging their best production, and works hard at developing the market for their products. Throughout the, um, through the textile preservation project, she has given, this, this now is Chinchero, and in fact, this is one of Nilda's many sisters. Um, she has given weavers a means to support their families. And she's also made them proud uh, of their ancient, of their uh, traditional traje uh, outfits, um, whereas they used to be sort of derided for appearing in public with them because it showed that they were indigenous. Now she's taught them to be proud of being indigenous and that they always wear these when, you know, important visitors are going to be coming to see their community work. So that's a requirement. Um, she also organizes them. You ha they have to elect a, a different president every year. Uh, she's an, an amazing organizer. The level of quality in the weaver's production has grown exponentially since 1997 when I first went there. I can just vouch for that. Okay, um, here are some examples. Uh, really, this is very large, uh, you know, probably almost eight feet square. It would probably be alpaca and maybe some sheep wool. Um, and then this one is um, a copy or a reinterpretation of an ancient a textile showing pelicans. So one feels part of Andean life during such weaving and, and dying day visits. The weavers in which you can arrange these through Nilda, of course, and through the CTTC. Just let her know when you're coming and she'll tell you what you know, what village will be having uh, a weaving or dying day that, that day. The weavers work unselfconsciously, weaving, spinning, and winding skeins in preparation for dying. So it's, it's very relaxed. It's really just a wonderful experience. So here we are back in my way. Pampa, some of those slides I showed you were from different communities. After the dye has cooked sufficiently, the skeins are laid out on the grass to cool before rinsing. Meanwhile, the weavers lay out their weavings in a patchwork in the courtyard some 30 mantas carpet the ground, laid down one at a time. Nilda evaluates them as the roll is called again. She points out technical errors in the weaving and makes side comments under her breath in, to me in English about some of the crazy color combinations. She selects products that the center will buy from the weavers and she assigns prices, rejecting others, which she says the weavers will be able to sell elsewhere. As the sun moves behind the hills, the chill of late afternoon replaces the warmth of midday 
and it's time for us to return to the city. Now I've finished th that little piece and I'm gonna show you just some other weavers again from, from Chawaitiri, where one of the special things there is that it's a men's tradition. Women also weave there, but the men really do a lot of the finest weaving. And that also was from Chawaitiri. You may have seen that view before. Um, and then this is a big thing, after school weavers. And let's see, Nilda is over here. So there you get an actual photo of her. Um, there is one in the, in the very beginning of before the, all the presentations started as well. Now, oh, and here's the museum. Um, back in Cusco, I visited, back in the day in 2002, I visited a temporary display at the Inca Museum, marveling at the beautiful products created by the various communities in recent months. Weavers from several communities are working on the site every afternoon. The next time I returned, uh, the new CTT Museum had been built, which is what you're seeing here, near the Cori Cancha Museum on Avenida Sol. And so it's museum and store. Another extremely special thing that Nilda does is um, the Tinkwis. The first one was in 2010, which was scheduled and then rescheduled. I didn't hear about the rescheduling, I missed it. 2013 was the second one I got to, and third one is 2017. And uh, the fourth one I think is in the planning stages, but of course everybody knows what's happening in the world right now. In any case, there's a parade at the beginning. And this is one shot from the opening parade. This is the Navajo delegation from 2017, the DNA from the United States, of course. Uh, here are Quechua weavers, they are your teachers. So go, it is not to be missed. You'll have goosebumps. <laughs> It was wonderful. Here's a uh, person who was there to demonstrate from the Amazon region. And now we have holiday pop-up shops. This represents uh, two, two different opportunities to support the CTTC and their products. Um, this one is through Andean Textile Arts. You'll see their email, uh, their, their website in a second, but it's very easy to find if you Google Andean Textile Arts. This is their pop-up shop for holidays. And this is through, now the CTTC itself has an online store. It takes longer to get your things. So if I, probably for the holidays, it might not be the very first choice, but it's nice to know that you now can uh, buy them straight from there. Also, Andean Textile Arts is a 501c3 if you'd like to donate. And here are their websites. And I'm finished. I hope I didn't run over too long. And I think we're doing questions at the end. Right, thanks, Kathy, that was terrific. Thank you. Just on time. And we're gonna go ahead to, with the next presentation and we'll take questions after Gloria's done. But next is Hetty and let's see what we can do about getting her to share the screen. How about that? It says I'm sharing, am I sharing? You are. You just need to start the slideshow and we're all set. Okay, um, my name's Hetty Hollyfield and I'm representing a, a small 5013C called Aini. Um, Aini is a, a Quechua word for mutual aid. I'll help you today and you help me tomorrow. And, and as uh, Kathy mentioned, Quechua is the, the native language in the, the highlands of Peru on up into Ecuador. Um, my cousin Barbara's an anthropologist. She was on a Fulbright there for a year. She's done most of her digs in Peru. And I fell in love with the textiles when I went to visit her back in 2005 and suggested that maybe we could do something to, um, um, to help the, the textile artists there. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, this is a little bit different than Kathy's in that I'm gonna talk a lot about history of the area and why it's an important area. Um, so our aim is to preserve the, the weaving or the textile traditions um, in the Andes through the sponsorship of cultural programs and through the sales of, of the primarily textiles there. Now the, the um, cultural programs that we've done are we've supported a number of graduate students in archaeology. We've sent our weavers to Tinque. We've sent them to other um, different sorts of programs down there. And, um, and also we, we sponsor like social welfare opportunities as they come along in the community. 
So the Ayacucho, which we, we saw on a map earlier, um, is, is in this area right here. And it is about 30 kilometers from Wari, which was the center of the Wari Empire. The Wari Empire ruled from down by the border of Bolivia all the way up into Ecuador for 700 years before the Incas. So it's, it's a archeologically very rich area. From there, the, the um, Wari are known for their building structures. Um, they do the stack stone that's not quite as elaborate as as the Incas because they didn't have the carving techniques that they did. Um, this is an excavation at Wari, the capital. So their, their buildings are all interconnected. They tend to live in villages that, that were all um, <clears throat> kind of as, as one. Um, textiles were, these are uh, ancient textiles. Textiles were um, primarily some ceremonial dress um, in today's culture, they've maintained the iconography, but have uh, the, they tend to be decorative pieces. So some people put them on the floor. The one behind me is actually one that I hang on my wall, um, and uh, you know various other sort of more decorative pieces. The one, this piece on the left is is a unique worry piece, and then it's it's called worry tie dye. And this technique was lost, um, but one of our textile artists in Ayacucho has discovered how to do it. And those of you who are in the St. Louis meeting may remember um, Saturnino and, and Vilma Onsabai that were at that meeting. And they're the, they're, they, that family in particular specializes in, in learning old ancient techniques. So the other thing that, that was um, really common in the area was elaborate embroideries. On the right, that's a that's a mirror. It's a very elaborate mirror embroidery with, I think, culture or mother of pearl around the edge, and then that's the the one on the left is a hat. Um, pottery was a big was a big thing there too, and so this is this is Barbara, the other founder, um, with some of the pots that she's dug from down there. This is this is from Conchapata, which is right in Ayacucho. It's interesting because the pots are bigger than, than the doorways to get into the, the buildings that they're in. So they don't really know how, you know, what their purpose was or what, if they were burial or ceremonial and, and why. But, but in that particular area, pottery was a big thing too. Historically, um, when, the, when, this, when South America won its freedom from, from uh, Spain, the Battle of Ayacucho is what really freed uh, the most of South America from Spanish rule. And that happened also right in Ayacucho. So we've got a historically rich and um, an archaeologically rich uh, area of the country. And it used to attract a fair number of tourists. But, oh, oh yes, it's a modern Spanish city now, sorry. I rearranged my slides this morning, I forgot. <laughs> this is the city as it is today. It's about 100,000 people. Um, it's a beautiful Spanish city. That's the main plaza. I think there's something like 33 churches there and they're a big attraction. They're all old Spanish churches. Um, a lot of people, the, the primary language, everyone speaks Spanish, but the, the first language for most of the people there is Quechua. So you see quite a bit of traditional dress there. This would be for a holiday, probably the uh, Easter holiday. Um, and you also see quite a few traditional crafts along the road. So this is a this is she's sitting on the steps into a church, and that the sling this is a sling braid. Um, and sling braiding is I don't know if it's unique to to South America, but it's a very strong braid that they use for hunting or for um, for sheep herding or or whatever. Um, so in, we actually have a colleague that wrote a book about the braids that they make in Peru um, because they're so, they're so intricate in the patterns. But so that's what the city is like today. In 1980, um, a lot of violence started and the center of the violence was right in Ayacucho. So the Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso was founded uh, in 1968 by Abimael Guzman 
Um, he was a professor at the university in Ayacucho, very charismatic fellow. And, um, and I've learned in the last week or so that he's like Maoist kind of philosophy. He wanted to overthrow the government um, and was very successful in that people took up arms and started rioting. I know there's a lot of other uh, disturbances in Peru at the time, but, but uh, and the government was quite corrupt, but about 69,000 people, mostly in Ayacucho died uh, during this time of violence. Uh, a lot of it stopped when, when Guzman was arrested in 1992, but there were still pockets of violence until the early 2000s. Um, because of that violence, it was brothers killing brothers. Uh, there's very little trust among people. Um, within your, your nuclear family, there's a lot of trust people. But outside of that, people have a really hard time. So the idea of a cooperative in, in the area is really, really hard for them to conceive of um, because they just didn't trust, trust people. And it is, everyone still knows um, people that died during that time. So now I'll get on to the weavers that we that we work with primarily. There's there are quite a few weavers in town. Um, we have about three or four families that we work with primarily, but there's there are a lot of other ones. There's just a limited amount of time for for us to get around to the workshops. Most of the textiles in Ayacucho are it's it's about eight and a half thousand feet, so it's too low for alpaca. So it's almost all sheep's wool. Um, and you'll see this is Alfred Ohio, one of the textile artists that we work with uh, in his studio. I believe he made the piece that's behind me too. And that's in his workshop, that's one of his daughters playing. Um, uh, they use all natural dyes. Uh, they go out. This is the area around Wari. And there are just a lot of cacti around. It's got um, cochineal on the, on the prickly pears and they harvest it. You can see that, that they, now they, they claim that their cochineal is far better than anything that we do in the States because they only harvest it at a specific time of year when it's got the best color, but I don't know if that's true or not. And, uh, and that's just an example of the, the range of colors you can get for, from primarily cochineal. There's obviously oh. some not cochineal there. Um, that's Alfredo in his workshop uh, on the loom. They use, unlike the rest of Peru, they do use, uh, they took the Spanish loom. So they use a floor loom. It's a two harness looms, but they almost all are, uh, they make their own. Uh, on the right is Fermin Ibar, uh, in, again, in his workshop. Uh, and that's Ilateria um, Waranka. Her husband is a, a weaver too, we, which we carry some of his pieces. She does the braiding and it's quite elaborate decorative braiding. I think the tradition is that single men wear one on their hat or their belt so that women will know that, that they're single and, and they can flirt with them. Um, but uh, that's what inspired, um, sorry. That's what inspired uh, Roderick to go there and, and learn the sling braiding techniques. So one of the things that I love about the weavings is they use very traditional iconography. The one on the left is, is like a direct replica of a historical piece, but they also do some modern interpretations of it. So they do this three-dimensional scrolling kind of, kind of uh, work. So they use the same, the same iconography, but the, they have a little bit different interpretation of it. So I'm just going to show you like these are some of the, the textiles that, that we have. One really common theme is this um, dark and light. That's the that's symbolic of you know darkness and life and day and brightness and life or daytime and nighttime. So there's there's heavy, heavy symbolism in in all of these uh, these textiles. These, I believe, are mosquitoes, the bugs along there. <laughs> they're either mosquitoes and, and then sometimes they're fireflies or ants and you can tell by the shape of their body, which is which. Um, I'm not sure what these, these uh, faces are here. 
which I can't remember now, but but uh, anyway, everything is 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 highly highly symbolic. On the left, there's these are the the Ori guardians. Um, you know, very typical. One of the really cool things about Ori, and I don't have a good example. I just didn't have time to dig one out. Is the Ori does? Is they almost um, do they they will repeat uh, a pattern in a weaving like this and then they'll the the second row over will be compressed by 50 percent and the next row over will be compressed again so it's a quarter the size of the original and it's quite it's it looks quite modern in design but uh but it's quite an ancient technique hmm. the other thing you see a lot this um this is to me this is a really special piece because the gradient that color gradient that they do from pale, pale gray to dark gray to dark turquoise to light turquoise is all done by the eye of the weaver. And, um, and so it takes quite a skilled weaver to recognize those, those color intonations. And, and you also, I don't know if you can, can tell, but these are pumas facing up, you know, going this way. And then there's, there's interlocking. These are pumas going down. So it's almost Escher Escher in terms of its design. But again, this is, this is a, a replica of an of a ancient textile. Wow. Um, just a couple of this, another example of the three-dimensional scrolling that the, these are quite popular in, in our sales. And this again, there's, if you look at ancient textile books, this is an exact replica of one that's been in there. <laughs> Again, you see the, the mosquitoes with the, and then you see these faces in here. Those are, I think, guardian faces, and then probably snakes along here that are interlocking. So now I just want to change subjects for a minute. Um, you might be relieved to know I'm almost done. Um, in During that time of violence, uh, the, a group of widows got together. Uh, it was almost all of the men that were, that were killed um, and it left a lot of, of women without any support at all and not knowing they, a lot of the bodies they never found. They, they dug mass graves and buried them. And, uh, and they formed this group called uh, Amphisap. Uh, they founded in 1982. It's the earliest human rights group um, in South America. Uh, they have a museum there. It's got these quite gruesome murals along the side. And, and they get together and do crafts together and sell things in their shop. So we, we said that's one of the mamas, they call them, one of the, the widows from that time. Um, we sent down this, this a friend of ours, Kat, who taught them to needle felt. And for a long time, we had needle felting cards. We don't get those anymore. Um, but, but they, uh, and that's, that's my partner, Barbara, with, uh, with some of the mamas and their, their goods for sale in their shop. So it's just, you know, that they've, uh, they've found a way to, to find um, friendship and, you know, support in amongst. And one of their purposes was to, to um, get reparations from the government and actually find out what happened to them. And they have in the last, I think five years, they've started exposing mass graves and finding finding the bones of the people that were killed. But uh, a lot of these widows have, have unfortunately passed away by the time that that happened. So that's the end of mine. I've got a website. I'm going to put the website in the online store in, in the chat so you don't have to write it down here. And that's all I got. Thank you very much. Um, our third presenter today is going to be Gloria Miller. Um, and Gloria is going to tell us about the group that she's worked with. It's a little more close to the ground kind of a project. Uh, it's called Las Cantutas. It's a group of young women. Let me. Would you start your slideshow? There you go. Yeah. Um, a group of young women approached one of our sisters in Peru. I, I, I am a sister of mercy and our sisters went to Peru in the early 60s and were looking for a place that was very, very poor 
and found a place called Chiquito in the Altiplano of Peru, 12,500 feet in the Andes, where the primary language is Aymara. And um, education wise, it was mainly the men who were educated and who spoke some Spanish. So uh, the farther out you got in the campo, the less likelihood there was of, of hearing Spanish. Her, one of our sisters, Deborah Watson, was there in uh, the early 90s. And some of the young women approached her and wanted to find a way where they could sell some of their knitting so that they could buy school supplies. And this gives you a little sense of the terrain, but the main reason this picture is here is this flower is called the cantuta. So that is the name they adopted for their group. And I went first went to Peru in 1996. I was asked to go visit because by that time there were a few young women who were joining our community. And uh, Marianne Clifford, who you see in this picture here, was invited me to go down because I could speak some Spanish and she wanted them to meet some other people. So uh, here we are, actually this was in a chapel in Lima. So here I am with Carmen Rosa Cayumamani, who is one of the Aymara women who has, is still in the community and Mary Ann and Patsy who went down with me. I'll give you a little sense of the geography again. Uh, this is the map that you already saw. Here's a blown up version of, um, of the area around Lake Titicaca. And the land is so important. The land and the lake are very important to the people. Their whole livelihood is there. It's a beautiful, beautiful region, uh, very stark. Here you see the lake and across the lake, the mountains are in Bolivia actually. So you're looking across from here over there. This is the Bolivian border. And most of these women live in Chiquito, which is a very small town, but there are actually some pre-Inca ruins right in that little town. Uh, some of you, who, if, you, if you've ever visited that area, might have visited the Urus Islands, which was, um, it's, they're actually made of reeds that they continue to pile on as they die. That is not land. That is a town built on reeds. Cool. And that's like a model of their little boat. These are some other ruins in the area that are pre-Inca. There I'm Mara. Uh, these were funerary um, burial mounds, Ma not mounds, but actually structures. Uh, on a small lake right off of Lake Titicaca. It's a very typical, you see people with some Western dress, but also uh, the typical weavings. This is actually Carmen Rosa when we were visiting Silustani. This is out when, in the Campo with Carmen's family. And here they had just cooked some chuño, it's like a little barbecue pit they make. Uh, and those are the freeze-dried potatoes that were from last year. This is her grandmother and niece and her father. So these are some of the knitters who started out. Originally, the sisters started sending like sweaters to sell. <coughs> And we found that the sizing just, we, they could not get the sizing right between trying to communicate from here and there. So this group decided to make finger puppets. And these are synthetic yarns uh, because of the bright colors and they're something they can get inexpensively and it, they're very available. So they started out making some pretty simple designs and over the years, we've worked with them to tweak the designs. And uh, 
give them some different designs. Like for example, I'm kind of proud of the Cardinal because for a while I was going to the Midwest a lot and I would bring the finger puppets with me and uh, people were asking, don't you have a Cardinal? And well, of course these young women don't know Cardinals. So I sent them some pictures and they came up with this design. Uh, these are some hats. These are uh, natural alpaca colors. And this is a yarn. The colored ones are yarn called Alpandina, which is a blend of baby alpaca, lamb's wool, and synthetics. And they get some very nice colors, and it's a very soft, lovely yarn that they use some for hats and scarves. These are some of the knitters. We were, some of us went there in 2013 for the 50th anniversary and they actually threw a little party for us. And we had a couple of meetings with the group as well. Um, I'm not a knitter, but some of the knitters might be interested in seeing how they hold their yarn and tension it. I'd, I'd say around the neck is the more common, but this woman seems to have created a little gizmo that works for her. Over a 10 year period, I was going to Peru at least once a year. And it was kind of funny because I I take two, two luggage bags and one of them was for me. And the other was with, I went on the trip over was things that they needed or gifts that people were sending. And then it would return with knitting. And at the time we were primarily selling things pretty sporadically at, um, some of you were in Burlingame for the warp meeting a few years ago. And we've always sold some items there. It's a retreat center. So there's a lot of different people going in and out and they've actually done quite well there. I started really working seriously with the program on the US end was in, um, maybe about 10 years ago, and got some items at the Quilt Museum in San Jose and also at the gift shop in the hospital where I work. And then some work members have also requested items for sale in other places. Here's another one of the women um, at the party they also made little story sets. Some were like three little pigs. I don't have any pictures of some of those right now to take good pictures, but um, that's a nativity set and some of the animal designs. They did a lot of birds. This is a pair of gloves that they came up with. It's really like a frog and they really can get some fun facial movements with them. You see a lot of the, the typical dress there, but also Western. And pe some people move back and forth, some wear one, some wear the other. We had started having some trouble last year with the supply end with getting things from there. And with the pandemic, it's been really difficult because the places where we've been selling items are not available. The quilt museum's closed, the hospital gift shop's closed, Mercy Center is closed, uh, and the women are wanting to be able to send us things. So it, it's a real, really a very difficult time. Here's another one of the women and her baby. Some more of the designs. This is the committee for the, the cantutas. So they're the ones that deal with quality control, finances. Basically the women are paid for what they make 
when they bring it in to the committee, that they, they take a look at it, make sure it's good quality. And things really have improved over the years. So they were putting on some dancing. Um, you can see the lake in the background. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. But when I first went there, it was pretty much sustenance farming. And you do get things go, you know, imported. Actually, in the Mercado one time, it was Christmas time, and there was Panettone from Italy. So it was um, kind of a, a big surprise to see that. But we're hoping when things settle down, we will be able to help rejuvenate this program. And Linda Temple often asks for items for her, her store in Oklahoma City. And previously, Janet Rodina had some, some of the work connections. So these are people who were also affected by the Sindero. Uh, not as bad as in Ayacucho, but um, certainly issues. So the finger puppets have done really, really well over the years. People buy them for children's gifts, but they put them on packages, on birthday cakes instead of candles. Um, and they're, they're each very unique. Um, you can see the facial characteristics are um, vary a lot and uh, they're, very, they're very entertaining. People are very intrigued by them. So we hope that this will be able to continue. And uh, if you have venues where we can sell them, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. So there've been quite a few questions that have come in as you've been talking and I'm gonna run through those. Hopefully um, I'll catch everyone. Um, if some of you wanna make comments, that would be great, but let's, we're gonna go through the questions first and then I'll open it up for comment. So if you have something you wanna share or something you wanna ask, just type it into the chat. Uh, let's see. The first one I wanna go back to is, um, Carol Buskirk wanted to know if anyone knew about the Center for Amazon Community Ecology and whether that was Peru based. Um, any of our panelists ever hear that? How about anyone else participating? If, if anyone here knows about it, unmute yourself and let us know about the Center for Amazon Community Ecology. I think um, I think I bought some stuff when I had my shop from there. Um, there was a, a guy in the Fair Trade Federation. Does does that ring a bell to this person who put the question? Yeah, up? yeah that's it. Stuff is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that familiar with it, other than just buying some products from him. That they sell some little hand woven um, like barrettes and pins, and then they have drums and different kinds of toys and, and they're supposed to be made in the Amazon region somewhere. Well, I found a website for them just by Googling it. So you might give that one a try. Center for Amazon Community Ecology. And they talk, it talks about events during 2019, but of course 2020 has been quite a year. Um, Susan Weltman asked a question, how have these three communities been affected by the pandemic? Um, Hetty, do you want to take that first? Well, Ayacucho is already a really, really poor area and the healthcare there is, is not particularly good. I think the, the lower population, I think Lima is like way, way worse and the arid conditions maybe, I don't know, but um, yeah, it's 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 not good. Of course, there's no tourists there because the uh, state or you know, the country's been closed international travel for quite a while. That's the same with Cusco, and um, we had a group meeting with Nilda the other night after a successful auction that helped. But 
yeah, they have, they can't sell product because there are no tourists there. I think that was one of the reasons that they put the store online now. And ATA has always, Andean Textile Arts has for a long time been selling their things as does Cloth Roads. Um, so those are ways that we can help out, but they don't have enough to eat. Gloria, do you have any comments about that? I haven't heard too much from there, but I know they're really having trouble. Um, people have lost their jobs. I don't know how many people have been sick, but um, even though it's a remote area, it's certainly affecting them. So I want to follow up for a minute on Kathy's comment and just ask all of you, um, to what extent, you know, the, the, the sale of crafts um, in, for U.S.-based artists um, has, has gone way down just because of the lack of shows and galleries closing and museums and that sort of thing. But um, it, it hasn't necessarily affected people's ability to eat and feed their families. It, how, how much is the sale of crafts in the communities you work with um, important to the well-being of the families? Well, it's typically the only, almost the only cash, you know, everything else is, is more or less barter. So, I mean, it's very, very important because of that. I mean, whatever they need cash for, it's from their sales of their textiles. Yeah, it's the same in Ayacucho. Um, there is a comment um, in, the, in the chat about uh, Sam and, and Tara Miller spent five months this year in, at, on Lake Titicaca. So they do, uh, they exchange solar panels. I mean, maybe they wanna say something about it. I don't wanna speak for them. They exchange solar panels for textiles to help the families down there both get electricity and then they get. So oh, I, I just unmuted myself. Um, this is Tara. And um, yeah, when the country shut down in March, um, we were still there and we actually only left the island uh, once during the extra two months that we were on Takile. And um, partly because we had heard that foreigners were being um, sort of targeted and, and possibly taken away or anyway, I ended up wearing the native dress even around on the island all the time, um, just so that I wouldn't be so noticeable and, and somebody asked one of the like um, town council members, oh, we heard they're tourists on Takile, foreigners. And he said, no, I haven't seen anybody. <laughs> they protected us. Um, the, what's happening is um, there are apparently, and I don't know how this is gonna play out now with the, the government, the federal government in such a confusion, but there have been monies that are that are have been going and increasing. They call them bonos, and their uh, single mothers are getting them, and some old people, or and also kind of a social security for people ha who have worked in the money economy in the cities for a while. Some of those are getting like a monthly or by every other month income that's that's helping for the hunger um, issues. But yeah, the the textile sales the Tourism, uh, tourism, of course, is just is completely gone, and um, we're sending cash every month, um, just out of our abundance to see what we can do to help. Um, but yeah, it it, it it's hard um, for people. One thing that I just heard yesterday is the the ancient tradition of the Aini. Um, the reciprocity mutual aid is is really being revitalized. It's always been present, but um, especially now when they don't have outside help and also because people have time, you know, they're not busy taking care of tourists. And so they have time to help somebody make adobes or break rocks to build their house or just plain share food with. So, um, uh, the communities, I think, might be getting stronger, but yeah, there, there is, 
I don't know how much right on Takile, but I'm sure there's hunger. And I just heard that there's more crime now in Puno than there used to be people stealing. So um, I think it's probably pretty tough. Let me uh, combine two questions that at once that sort of speak to this things you're talking about. One question was how can people in the state send money if they want to help people in these communities? And the second was uh, someone was particularly struck by the Trump loyal pieces and the gradient weave from Ayacucho and wants to know where it might be possible to buy them. Well, INI has an online store just this year, thanks to the fact that all the, the wool festivals, which is where we usually sell, are, are, were canceled. So I put that in the chat. Well, um, let's do it again now so that we can yeah. kind of get them all in and, the chat. Yeah, so I know Cloth Road sells uh, online too, I believe. And Andean and Textile Arts, as well as CTTC, take donations. Okay, yeah. So Andean but, Textile Arts, um, Marilyn just put that in the chat.org. Yeah. Um, CT. TC, is that right? I'll put it right now. Okay. And Gloria, someone had asked if it was where it would be possible to buy the finger puppets. Or do you have an online presence anywhere? We can't hear you. Uh, Jenna from Easter. That work? No, we do. Okay. Um, we don't have a website. It would be through me. So G Miller RSM at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat. That would be great. Um, so someone said, yes, but how do you wire money? We know that Andean Textile Arts, Kath Catherine said, takes money, as well as the Center for Traditional Textiles in Cusco. Um, uh, Hetty. Would you take it, donations that could be shared with the people that you work with, Gloria? Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's a, a donate option on our website, and we can okay. see that that it would it would go to the community down there. Very good. And Gloria is going to type her email address, right? Actually, I'm having a little trouble here, but I'm in the work. Okay, I can do it. G Miller, is that right? G Miller at gmail rsm at gmail so it's two R r's and an sm rsm you know that andy and textile arts you you could send money by credit card or paypal or those kind of methods too doesn't have yeah. to be required i just put that uh andy and textile arts also has since they're based in the u.s but they're representing cttc it's 501c3 tax exempt whereas you can donate Right. Otherwise, it's not based in the U.S., so it's not going to have that status. Okay, so I'm mindful of the time. It's now two o'clock. Um, if there's anyone that has a pressing question or comment, um, speak now. Uh, if not, uh, I want to extend all of our appreciation to you for dealing, putting up with a little bit of technical problems and participating and being uh, a great audience for this presentation. We're up to 96 people right now. So we had a really tremendous turnout. Um, you can count on the fact we're gonna do this again. Uh, the next session, again, the, if you weren't here at the beginning, it's going to be on the topic of Sub-Saharan Africa and it will be on the third Saturday of December, same time, same place. Um, you can sign up on the WARP website, give us a week or two to get that all straightened out, but mark your calendars now to remember. <laughs>